today we have two of the most fun and interesting people I know in Bronxville to be with us, Penny and John Barr. Thank you, Penny and John, for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you. Glad to be here. Now, most of you, when you think of the bars, think of poetry. And we're going to be, for sure, talking about poetry today and the Poetry so Club, not society, Poetry Club of Bronxville, and the fact that our poet laureate, the United States Poet Laureate, is going to be with us. We're going to do a lot on poetry and what John's done, but you are also going to find out that these two individuals have many other interests, which makes them so fascinating. So I thought we'd begin, uh, what you may not know at the, is that these two people hail from the same part of the country, uh, grew up together, and uh, let's find out a little bit about that. Penny, tell us where you all started out. Well, I'll speak for myself first, I guess. I was born in Wisconsin, Oshkosh, Wisconsin, which is where Oshkosh Bagosh is from. And, Pe and John was, is from? Omaha, Nebraska. Omaha, okay. okay. Omaha, Nebraska. Two Midwesterners. Yes, and you're from the Midwest also. A place so. dear, to my, <laughs> dear to the heart. There are a lot of Midwesterners. A lot of very good people here. <laughs> Midwest. Transplanted Midwesterners. And I really, I uh, was in Wisconsin for a very long time. Then we moved to Illinois for high school. And that's where John and I first met. When you we went were, to the same high school. We went to the same it high school. It was a small high school, I understand. It was a rural school yeah. uh, with uh, 52 kids in our graduating class. And <laughs> did you date in high school? Did not. We were good friends. Uh, everyone How in that class was good friends. How could you not want to date? <laughs> <laughs> Penny was the homecoming queen. Uh, she dated she a, wouldn't look at you. She dated the high school <laughs> football captain, and <clears throat> I was the valedictorian. Uh, <laughs> Smart later on, right? <laughs> anyway. That's exactly right. I remember uh, John and I were very good friends, and we went to church Sunday school together every Sunday. His brother drove the Christian and I would, Science Church, the Christian there, Science right? Church in Downers Grove, Illinois, because that's where the church was for our high school and our town where we lived. And uh, he has a brother four years older, and I used to sit between his brother, who drove because John didn't have his driver's license yet. And John on the other side, and I was always looking at his brother. Ah, and, <laughs> and, I was, and all the girls and my friends knew I was going every Sunday morning with his brother next to me. <laughs> so it was just fun. But. And then, and then you, you uh, obviously for college. Uh, went our separate ways. Went your separate I ways for a while. Came east, and Penny stayed uh, more locally. Penny, for what did you studied music, right? Uh, I studied music. <clears throat> I had gotten into music in really in the younger years. My mother said, "Do you really want to play the piano?" Yeah. And and I had to almost swear my life away in order to get a piano, and then we did, and from then on, piano was my life. So you went, so, where to college? You went to the... So I went to, I studied at a college before I was out of high school, and I liked the teacher so much, so I went right to her at that college, and that's where I studied for the four years, which was North Central College outside of Chicago uh -huh. in Naperville, Illinois. And uh, every now and then you hear about North Central College. It's a small... Um, I think it was an Evangelical United Brethren related school at the time. Mm -hmm. It was very good for but me. But you went on to get your master's in music, right? And then the I went on for my master's in music uh, at the University of Wisconsin. And you play the harpsichord, don't you? As well as. Yeah, well, any keyboards. And any keyboards. What's really fun now is to play the electronic keyboards. I really like them, and our boys play those. And right. And I would never have thought of doing that myself, except they were in the house as our boys were growing up here in Bronxville, and so I was right. diddling around on them. My sister is a pianist and plays on electronic keyboards, and it's a lot of fun. You can have a whole orchestra behind you that right. way. Right. And speaking of your children, who were and are still playing keyboards, you have three children. You have, uh, well, tell yes, us. Yes, we've raised three children here, all in this school system. Nate, who is now 28 and out in California. Chris, who is 26 and in Bennington, Vermont. Both of them very musically inclined. They're both right? very involved Nate's in music. Nate's in yes. uh, working in Hollywood, right? Yes, writing he's music in the scores. movie industry and writing uh, music for movies. Right. And Chris, we are not sure which direction he's going to take, but will be something. He just in music. graduated from Bennington yes, College. Yes, from yeah. Bennington College. <laughs> and Jenny's just about ready to go to college. And Jenny's a senior, and she is the one that is involved in music in a different way, where she is in ballet and dancing. Yeah. to classical music. 
Now, John, let's get back to you. Then you left, and you went out, you went to? Came east. I went to Harvard College on a Navy scholarship. On a Navy scholarship. Yes, in those days, the Navy would uh, pay for most of the cost of college in return for a period of service afterwards. Mm -hmm. So Penny and I both graduated from college in 1965, and one hour after graduation, I had taken the gown off and put ensign shoulder boards on and reported to my ship, which happened to be You didn't get married before? No. So no. you went over to Vietnam? I did. In fact, I basically lived on ships for the next five years. Oh, wow. And uh, one ship was an old World War II destroyer uh, based in Newport, Rhode Island. The other was a brand new guided missile frigate out of San Diego. Both ships went to Vietnam, so I ended up going for three different cruises to the Pacific and oh, to wow. Vietnam. Now you wrote, uh, actually you wrote a lot when you were on on the um, ship, right? I did indeed. What was the name of the um, book you wrote? I think you even have it here. The, the first, John has written what? Uh, published six, six books. Six books counting everything. On yes. poetry. Yeah. So we'll talk hopefully about a lot of them. But what was that first book? That the, you the Navy really was my entry point to serious writing. Uh -huh. uh, being a uh, an English major on a ship that spent 30 days of time in Tonkin Gulf, I needed some other things to, uh, to that was my anchor to windward in a way. <clears throat> so I, I wrote a great deal. I graduated from college with a full set of poetry ambitions. I really wanted to do something. So you knew books. by then that you really wanted to be a poet. Yes, I wanted it, poetry to be a big part of my life. And yeah. I had read a lot of it. I'd taken a lot of courses, studied some writing, and also studied the modern poets a lot. So mm -hmm. I had a grounding in that. And that Who became, were the modern poets that were most influential on you at that point? I think uh, a lot, like a lot of people in my generation, we read a lot of T.S. Eliot, Robert Frost, Wallace mm -hmm. Stevens, Ezra Pound, William Carlos Williams, uh, people of that generation. Yeah. Anyway, I didn't mean to cut you off. Now sure. you're on the boat, and all you're doing is sailing around the right. Bay. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> and may I say, writing a lot of letters, and I would write letters to him, and it would take if, if for. So any... this is how you got back. When did you? Why did you start writing letters? You weren't even dating her. We were. Well, I was just about to graduate uh, from college. I was a senior, uh -huh. and I said, "Gee, I wonder if Penny Glassman is married yet." <laughs> so <laughs> I was over in Europe on a midshipman cruise. I sent her a postcard, and it turned out that was she and wasn't. on the postcard. <laughs> what was, was poetry? Was poetry, and it was a it was a poem, and it was signed just John Barr. And I thought, John Barr, <laughs> who is he? After <laughs> three that? years or four years, John Barr. Oh, how wonderful! He's, He's been thinking about, about you all this time. Penny, a new Harley homecoming queen, remember? <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought that was wonderful. So I I must have written back right away. No, but this was this poem that you. Um, a poem a that, story behind that this I poem. love. I call it John's first poem. Of course, it was probably his fiftieth poem, but the last two lines um, we liked so much, and it was so much a part of our early relationship that we had them inscribed in our rings. In either of your rings. Yes, so Isn't he has one, <laughs> one sentence and I have the other sentence on the rings. Wait, what, are the, what are the sentences? I can give the first line. She yeah, can the last <laughs> no, the, it was a, poem, a short poem about rain. And about rain. The first line was, uh, I stand outside to feel the small cold impacts in the dark. Mm -hmm. That's the rain hitting. Yeah. And then the last two lines, if I may quote, uh, were, uh, the rain is everywhere and passionate as love for persons or the world can be. So one line is in my ring and one line is oh, in Fanny's ring. That is just <laughs> a wonderful. little romantic. That's a story that I never do. <laughs> anyway, so you start, kept getting all these letters and poetry. And you kept writing your first major. I had a lot of time to write major, letters. In what, was the major, what was the name of the book again that, that you the, published? The first book that I published in 1989 was called The War Zone. Uh -huh. And uh, Marcia, that was the book I sort of grew up on writing. So uh, when I finished my Navy service in 1970, I had lots of writing, but it was in a raw state. Yeah. And as I developed and learned how to write my own voice in the next years that followed, over a 14-year period, really, I... We wrote that manuscript uh, three different times, oh, and that became my excruciating. Well, it was it was a labor of love, as they say, yeah. and I uh, th I matured, I think, in terms of having a voice of my own as a poet yeah. uh, with that book when it got published. Now, what was the theme of the book? It was uh, about the experience of living on a modern steamship, painted gray, in a wartime situation. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a phrase that English majors encountered called "Billings Roman," which is 
typically a novel about a young man growing up, and there was that in the book, too. It was my coming of age as a person. Um, so that was what the book was about. And my poetry ambition was just that. Uh, my impression of nautical poetry was pirate ships and sailing ships and sort of old romantic kinds of right. treatment. And this was the modern world I wanted to capture. And so the book was about that. About modern. And yeah. did you do anything on Vietnam itself? Do you discuss on that? I, I wrote... Uh, if your question is, is the book about that? Yes, yeah. it's. I, uh, I wrote a number of poems in that book about uh, standing on watch and uh, recovering downed airplanes. One, we were very close to the uh, to the combat zones. We were in the combat mm -hmm. zone, and one of the missions of our ship was to rescue down flyers. And sometimes they wow. came back okay, and sometimes they didn't. And so uh, that's all in the book too. Yeah. Wow. Now. Eventually, you two got together. How, how did that come about? When did uh, when you returned, John, or uh, did you fly out and marry him on the battleship? Or, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I was uh, I while he was in the Navy, I went directly into graduate school at University of Wisconsin in right. Madison in music, and that was a two-year program for me. Uh, and I, what I really wanted to do, and it always wanted to do, was to teach in college rather than teaching as an, an orchestra director, because I was a pianist, I didn't play uh, string instruments, or actually I played a clarinet, but I didn't want to go into band or teaching in the public school system. I really wanted to teach individuals and teach music history, which you really don't find in high schools very often. Yeah. So I had to get my master's degree right away. And I also had a dear friend uh, uh, who was not a roommate in undergraduate who wanted to go and be an English major. So we said, Unlike today's kids when they apply, we applied to one graduate school and we said, if we get in, we'll go together and we'll room together. And, did you, and we both you applied and we both got in and we both roomed together. <laughs> well, and it was great. great and we loved it. And it was then you wonderful. went on to teach, right? You taught. Um, and then after that, I went on to teach. Uh, I was very fortunate to get a job immediately out of graduate school. Uh -huh. It was very and tough to get teaching? jobs then. Uh, and I taught piano, and, uh, uh, piano in a conservatory. Uh -huh of a very fine university, Lawrence University sure. in Appleton, Wisconsin. Yeah. And it was a great experience for me, and I loved it. And I was planning on staying a second year, but then John asked me to marry him. Long ah. distance, Long by distance. telegram. By telegram, <laughs> off the boat? <laughs> off yes, boat. off the boat. <laughs> It was you were, in 1968. 1968. Uh, yeah, yes. The bombs were flying, and you, 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 you <laughs> sent a telegram to Penny. I did indeed. I, I think that had some poetry in it, too, as I remember. Yes. <laughs> and did you fly? Where were you married? Did you stay in Appleton? Did he manage well, to get back here? Well, you should mention how you yeah, got back. I had a wonderful captain, and we were close to the end of my second of the three cruises there. Uh -huh. And he heard that I had proposed and been accepted. Uh, so uh, he arranged for me to fly home early. So I, I left the ship shortly before... Uh -huh. It headed back to the United States, flew home to, uh, to Pennysome, Appleton, Wisconsin, and that's where we were married. And then we had a short honeymoon and went, actually the honeymoon was really in San Francisco and San Diego, mm -hmm. because you were going to a nuclear weapons school? I was going to a missile school, missile and I became school. the missile officer on mm -hmm. my, my mm -hmm. ship, so that was a wonderful three months in the San Francisco Bay Area while I went to school. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then, of course, after you got out, you moved, where did you, you landed here in New York City, did you... Um, I mean, John, we're going to skip again. You, you've been managed to somehow be a, a poet and at the same time really be a businessman, too. So yes. when did you both come to New York? I mean, what brought you to New York? If, if I can fill in that gap, yeah. uh, when we were done with the Navy, then uh, I had applied and been accepted to business school. So I went back to Harvard for ah, that. in the interim. Yes, okay. and so in 1970, we both moved to Boston. And so uh, Penny worked, and uh, I went to school and That's until right. I graduated. You, you worked with the Christian Science Monitor, right? I worked for the Christian Science Monitor, uh -huh. and then I worked for the Mother Church. I had a year in each of the places, and it was that was the best thing I could have done. At the time, I thought, oh, why can't I find a teaching job? I right. can't believe there are no teaching jobs available. But because there weren't, I did go to work for them, and it was far better for me to have done that because 
that has meant a lot to me over the years, whereas teaching would have been another teaching job. Right, and you've been a reader, a first reader at the Christian Child. Yes, Science I've been Church the first reader too. here in Bronxville, yeah, and it's been a wonderful you're experience. Hours, <laughs> hours, and every Sunday it's a big preparing job. the lesson. I think people who aren't familiar with it don't, don't yes, realize what the Yes, but it's a wonderful growing is. time for yeah. a person in the church, also. So I was fortunate to have the opportunity. So after you graduated, then did you finally come? Did you yes. come here to Bronxville, <laughs> or did you? Uh, uh, were you we we, we uh, had some friends and knew nothing about New York. Friends. We had some friends in the area, right? <laughs> I never would have and they said, "Well, look around here." So we actually initially rented an apartment right off Exit Five of the Cross County, ah. and uh, I had a job starting at Morgan Stanley in July of 1972. So this summer will mark 30 years ago, uh, and so that was our first home here and then in New you York. Moved here into Bronxville, um, John. You at Morgan Stanley? Were you always in the public utilities area, the energy area. I mean, you, you have a whole story now that Enron is on to tell uh, about that. But um, That is another story. You were at Morgan Stanley in this area, right? Yes, I was uh, 18 years at Morgan Stanley altogether, uh -huh. and I was a generalist in corporate finance, the investment banking, uh, for several of those years. And then uh, we had the wonderful invitation or request from Morgan Stanley to go over to Tokyo for three years. And so right. uh, we did that from 1975 to 78. You were with Morgan Stanley, the two of you. Picked up everything. The kids were young. We had one child, just Nate, who was two and a half at the time. Yeah. And I remember John calling up. <laughs> now, I'm a little farm girl from the Midwest. Not, <laughs> I had not believe even, a word. <laughs> I had been to Mexico, to Tijuana, and that's the only place I'd ever been, and once to Canada to a lake with my parents when I was very young where the water was freezing cold. John called up and said, how would you like to go to Tokyo? I said, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, when you got there, so, you even, couldn't even read the characters. It was no, a little challenging, no. right? Uh, no. And, and I remember everything in Japan seeming, for those also in this community who have lived in Japan, everything was miniature. We didn't have the small cars and trucks we now have. They were all in Japan. <laughs> right. So we arrived and we felt like giants. Of course, All Japan the chairs were narrow, off then, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it was a wonderful experience for the whole family. Yeah, and really then our second years. was born there. Chris was born. Chris there. was mm -hmm. born there. One month I after we arrived. Yeah. Uh, one month after, after you arrived, arrived. I didn't realize that yeah. you moved over eight months mm -hmm. pregnant. That was he says he's quite. He something. still says he's Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what a wonderful experience for them, even if they were pretty yeah. young when you mm -hmm. went. Um, and you came back, and then you did something very exciting, John. You started a company that's on the front page of the New York oh, Times, yes. even as we sit. Yeah, I can fill that in as well. I, when I came back, I was invited to go into the utility group, and I did that. Right. Uh, and then was in that group at Morgan Stanley for about uh, a, two years, and they asked me to become the head of that. So. Uh, I found myself as a junior partner at Morgan Stanley in the early 1980s and trying to figure out how to get business because that's what we were there to do. And uh, someone came along and said, why don't you start a gas brokerage trading business uh, because, you know, that's the new thing. Right. And the, uh, the government had just deregulated natural gas and pipelines, so it was possible to think about that. To show how wrong I am about things, I thought this will never fly as a business idea, but it will give me an excuse to talk to all these CEOs in the gas industry and get clients for them. <laughs> so I didn't get any clients out of it, but we did start the company that was called Natural Gas Clearinghouse, and over time that became uh, what is Dynergy today. So. Dynergy. Now, Dynergy had made a bid to buy Enron yes. and pulled out. Exactly. And uh, <laughs> Dynergy, Dynergy is a wonderful company. Uh, how I was, long were you? Uh, founding chairman and CEO of I, Well, I, I actually started it twice. The first time I started it, it was a joint venture with six gas pipelines, and I spent a year on airplanes getting that organized. And mm -hmm. it didn't, it, it fizzled after about 18 months. So my choice was to um, fold my tent uh, and steal off the field or to restart it. And uh, not knowing when to quit, I started it again, hired Chuck Watson, who's the CEO of it today, and I was the chairman then. He was the president for the following five years while it got really based and started. Yeah. Yeah. And it changed its name. It went public in um, about 1984, and it... Uh, uh, as you say, has been on the front pages a lot in the last six months because as Enron encountered its misfortunes, uh, Dynagy, who was the only other company that 
could really answer to it in the energy marketplace uh, st was asked to step in and, and acquire them or merge with them. Right. And at the moment, as we speak, it it's, uh, was announced but then canceled. Right, right. And now you went on, we'll get back to poetry because that's what's <laughs> also very interesting, but you went on to form your own company. Yes, in my I was 18 years at Morgan Stanley, and the firm went public uh, in the mid-80s, and after right. that period ran its course. I, uh, I retired, and with two partners, uh, we started an investment banking boutique, which we called Bar Devil and Associates. And we really kept doing what uh, we had done at Morgan Stanley for years, which was to serve the, the um, utility sector with investment banking services. Mm -hmm. And so that business um, went great, and we uh, were sort of there for the mergers that occurred in the 90s. I tell friends that we were selling, it's like being a pretzel vendor in Manhattan and you're on the right corner where everybody wants to buy a pretzel. Everybody wanted to do a utility merger. In the at that time, so you and were at the right place at the right, right time. Right place at the right time and it was wonderful and ultimately we received an offer to buy our company from a French bank, Societe Generale, uh -huh. and we were very pleased to do that about four years ago. So you've sold out or are you? I'm still uh, in it. You're still in it. So are my partners, and uh, so we. I'm now uh, uh, called the global sector head, whatever that means. But what I really do, I'm responsible for the um, business, the utility business, on a global basis for mm -hmm. that bank. So that's what we do. So, and you're also now picking up. You're going to be doing more and more poetry. Is that is that your? Uh, yes, your goal? I I haven't I haven't quit the business world altogether, but I would like to shift the balance so that uh, I do more um, writing, more mm -hmm. publishing. I have a lot of writing that's sort of in progress, and uh, I think I'll teach as well, do some yeah. teaching. Now, in the interim, Penny has <laughs> taken the baton, <laughs> and she has organized Bronxville. Penny has really been the, uh, the founding chairman and, and the whole energy be behind the Bronxville Poetry Club. Don't ever say society. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a little bit how, how you got it going. Well, I figure if you can't beat them, join them. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, my interest in music outside of helping our children and working with the school with the school musicals, which I did for many years. Oh, Penny loved played doing all those the music school musicals. Oh, it was so much fun, and there were kids that would play with it, and we'd have little bands. It was really, really a great time. But our children are now out of that area. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was time for me to do something else. And if you're really a practicing musician, you have to practice all the time. Absolutely. And I lost interest in that probably 20 years ago. Right. You got interested in wolves for the a Africa, couple of and years. Very still Good interested memory. in wolves, animals, dogs. Yeah. Um, but and horses. And horses. horses. Has been one of your That's horses. right. Very nice of you to remember Big that. Big hobby. You have about six to eight horses. Yes, year. we do yeah. in Mackinac. And it's a great place, Mackinac Island, Michigan, a great place to have horses in for the summers. Right. But the poetry happened. It was a bit odd that I would go into poetry because I, I really don't know much about literature and poetry, although I always love taking literature courses as the alternative courses mm -hmm. in college. But John and I went to the Time Life Building maybe 15 years ago to a special poetry reading that you knew about through the Poetry Society, maybe in Yaddo. And it was so interesting. There were hundreds of people there. It was a beautiful room. And there were five or six well-known people on the stage. Now I say well-known. I'm trying to remember who they were. Eugene McCarthy was Eugene one McCarthy. who is a poet. Mm -hmm. And um, the, someone the like Senator Eugene McCarthy. Yes, yes, oh, Senator he's a Eugene. Poet. He's a poet. He, he studied yeah. in the yeah. '60s. He, while he was in office as a senator, he studied writing poetry with Robert Lowell. So there are a lot of you guys around who, who do two things at the same yeah. time. There are. We're going to talk about that. You, had, you wrote a wonderful article on here explaining how you did two things. Well, um, we'll talk about that in a second. No, I'm trying to remember if Barbara Walters was one of the five or six. But anyway, there were five or six prominent people in the general world community really and they had selected their favorite poems and they were asked to read them and they were it was a live coverage on television and I looked up there and I was already the program chairman of the library here and I thought we could do in that Bronxville, in Bronxville, Bronxville. Yeah. I thought we could do that in Bronxville this would be wonderful it would advertise poetry it would give people an opportunity to read poems Right. We'd find out who likes poetry and is there an interest in the, in the community. So the first three years or the three years I was program chairman here, we always made Super Bowl Sunday 
Mm-hmm. Which Poetry we thought Sunday. that's a time everybody's home. All They're going the to be watching would get later. Together, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so we had that, and it was uh, we invited the mayor at the time, who was Sheila Stein, mm-hmm. and several other people to read. And then we had it the next year, and you've read it. And we had it the next year. Nancy Hand has read. It really as the caught mayor. on, didn't it? The Super Bowl Sunday was great. So tell, tell people how the current. Uh, so anyway, the rest is so almost the, history, and you really developed this wonderful. Club. Well, we ha- I had a co-chairman, Mary Elizabeth Bunzel, who has since Who's moved into the yeah, city. That's too bad. But we put to. She said, "I'll help you form a club," because we asked and we had people fill out a sheet, and there was quite a bit of interest in forming an actual poetry club. Right. Now, how does this club work? I mean, there's already been, what, four or five meetings this year. How, how, do, how does the club work? Well, it's, a, it's very loose, I must say. We don't have any officers or anything, but we have approximately six gatherings, we call them gatherings a year, in people's homes, in their living rooms, and we invite anybody that would like to to come and read their favorite poems, and we um, have it videoed, and then it appears on the local cable channel, which is a wonderful place to advertise poetry. Right, and this coming, uh, let's see, uh, January 27th, right? Isn't that, Mm -hmm. you are having, we're having a special meeting right here in the Jaeger room, which is where we're we're taping this now. And we're going to have the Poet Laureate of the United States. (laughs) Isn't that amazing? Well, say his name. (laughs) Say his name. Billy Collins. (laughs) Right, and the two of you, I'm sure, were very instrumental in, in getting it account. was wonderful. He, we invited him to read uh, at one of our poetry fundraisers, the Poetry Club fundraiser at Panay Vino, and he came and everybody loved him, thought he was great. And now all of a sudden he's Poet Laureate, so we looked him up to see if he would be available, and we also very much wanted to interview Diane Collins, who's just a wonderful his person. Wife. His, his wife. wife. And actually, she played a role in, in redoing this library. Yes, yeah, we wanted to on... see what her life was like with him uh-huh. and she, what and her life a... is like with her own business that I'm she I'm going to hold this up again. There's an article both on Bill Collins and one on Diane. She's called the First Lady of the Poet Laureate. <laughs> and there's a wonderful article that you wrote, John, in well, it, too. You. And Penny yeah. did a lot of the yeoman's work in putting this together. It's the annual poetry issue of the the villager, right? Yes. So, and tell us, Billy Collins, for me, is one of the funniest poets I know. He's oh, just he is. He's yeah, just wonderful, and he has a new book out. And poets will usually want to read from their new books, so I suspect that's what he'll do. It's a good way to advertise it. Yeah. But it's very nice for Bronxville. Can anybody come to this? Um, anybody can come. It's free. There are no tickets. And what time first does it come, begin? First serve. It's, um, People should get here probably about quarter to two or two o'clock. Mm-hmm. Uh, he'll start reading at about 2.30. And, being, ex- and note this year, it is not on Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> Why is it not on Super Bowl Sunday? I, mean, I the think because of the 9-11, like, Super Bowl oh, Sunday was moved to another um, day uh, uh, later on in the, in the year. Mm-hmm. But we're having it always the end of January, this special event. And it's wonderful. He, it's very nice that he could come. He's hard to get, but he yeah. came here because well. his wife did the wonderful work in the library and... They're a very close couple, and it's it'll be a, a fun time to be It's going to be everybody. something very special for us. Yeah. Now, Joan, let's get back a little bit mm-hmm. to your poetry. Um, after you um, wrote um, the you know the book on the battleship, um, right? The war, the war zone was the, the name war of the zone. Book. How right. can you forget that? Uh-huh. Yeah. Then you went on to write some others. I did. Uh, and, and tell us a little bit about that, and why you why you write about it. What, sure. what you're trying to yeah. do? Uh, there was a. I said earlier in this talk that uh, I found my voice about the age of 40 in terms of poetry and my mm-hmm. stuff. So last year you found your voice. <laughs> I wish. Just kidding. Uh, just <laughs> kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? And uh, there were a few other landmark events for my development as a writer. Uh, I went to a workshop in Manhattan that was uh, sort of moderated by a wonderful friend and poet who's now unfortunately passed away named Bill Matthews. And he, uh, he, is, he has Billy Collins' kind of humor. Uh, he's a wonderful poet, and we're, we miss him greatly. But he helped me understand 
the level of sophistication in audiences today. And uh, so that was a great experience for, me for two or three years. What do you mean, understand the level of sophistication? I think a lot of people have all the right feelings to write poetry. Uh -huh. What may hold them back from writing poetry that's going to be sought after in publications is that they are writing for themselves, and it's completely sincere, good poetry. Mm -hmm. But uh, poetry is about communication. Mm -hmm. And to communicate to a readership, you have to develop your own sense of what's obvious and what's not so obvious to the level of sophistication of that readership. Mm -hmm. I lack that. I, nobody's born with it. You just get it. And I think the great advantage of a poetry workshop, and there are many in this country today, is that you can ex expose your work to fellow poets who will say, I like this, I don't get that. It's mm -hmm. a peer group review process. Now, do you have a message, a, a theme in your poetry that you're trying, or something you're searching for that you want to Get no, I, I think the primacy of the experience has to be what the poem's about, mm -hmm. as opposed to a moral or a yeah. lesson or anything else. Uh, Robert Frost, I love everything he ever said about writing poetry as well as his own work. Which but he, is, he says, a poem begins in delight and ends in wisdom. And it runs a lucky course of events. And at the end of it all, if it's successful, it will, uh, uh, how does he put it, it will create... Uh, a slight clarification of the universe. Um, he said it better than I just did. I love that. Begins in delight and, and ends, ends in, in wisdom. wisdom. Right. And now, one of your major works was called Grace. Yes. And that's almost an epic. Tell us a little it bit is. about Well, Grace, Grace uh, is the most recent book I've published. Grace right. uh, was written and developed by me. Let me hold this up. Sure. Me. Thank you. This is that's... a lot inside. You can't really tell from <laughs> thank looking you. at it. Grace uh, was a poem that uh, wrote itself. It, was, it, it erupted from me. And it erupted from me uh, as having everything I wanted to say in the voice of a Caribbean gardener. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps looking back, it was my alter ego. And this fictional character was named Ibn Opsit, uh, which has its own puns built into it. Right. And uh, Opsit uh, is, uh, Grace is, is the name of a, hypothetical Caribbean kingdom, which I think of as being like Haiti, uh -huh. where there's an oppression of people generally by a, a corrupt government and a wealthy class. And so this, was, this book, although it's based in a Caribbean dialect, is really about America as seen through the eyes of this protagonist. And it was just, it was a wonderful experience to write that book. It was uh, published in 1999. Yeah, not too long ago. Not too long ago. Observations about America. Yes, really is. What are some of the key observations? Uh, well, I had a lot of fun with uh, takeoffs, and uh, this. I hope this book's uh, protagonist has the knowing innocence of Huckleberry Finn. A lot of the book happens as a series of jailhouse monologues where opposite awaiting his execution for a crime he witnessed but did not commit uh, is trying to explain the world uh, to his half-wit cellmate, who never says a word in the book. Mm -hmm. And at the end, we're still wondering if he really exists or if Ops is just talking to himself. But one of the key observations in the book happens in the courtroom at the beginning, where under the laws of the state of grace, you may be found guilty of what you see. And so uh, he, in effect, is called in as a witness, and they declare what they call German jeopardy, which means that all of a sudden he's held responsible for what he witnessed under the laws of the state of grace. And so he goes out as the convicted <laughs> And the um, one that actually did it, they never find it. Well, anyway. the, the, the <clears throat> person that actually did it is a wealthy uh, uh, landowner who it was a, a killing uh, that he did in his own home yeah. and uh, opposite happened to witness it while he was cutting flowers on the estate so <laughs> <laughs> you'll have to read this again to get the depth of it all <laughs> now what are you working on right now i've just finished a sequel Oh, what's so, the sequel? Called? Well, so for those who can't get enough of <laughs> <laughs> Penny's got plenty. Of it. <laughs> no, but uh, for those who can't get enough, I really I, when I finished this book and published it, I found that that character was still talking in my head. It still uh -huh. had more to say. So uh, I now got uh, a new book called uh, "The Extended Adventures of Ibn Opsit, and that's the sequel. 
And this has been published now? Or it's no, it's out? not. I haven't sent it off yet. Uh -huh. I've had interest expressed in the book, and I hope to publish it soon, but I'm still polishing it. You're still polishing it. Yes, oh, I It's so hard to give up something like it that. It is, actually. You don't want it to be over. And I hear you get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and, and, and do your poetry Once writing. in a while, and I ride a lot of airplanes in business, and that's a good time to write, too. You can or ride on the airplane. Back of, in the backs of taxi cabs, it's, yeah. uh, the lines come whenever they want. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Are you forever finding scribblings around the house? Or do you, I do am, you? and I, it was interesting to talk with Diane Collins, the wife of <laughs> a poet. The two of you have a lot in we common. We have a lot in right. common, and we know that paper napkins in restaurants are very <laughs> handy to have, and I always carry an extra pen. <laughs> yeah, John, I remember you once saying that when something came, you knew you had to write it down because you'd forget it and never yes. get the same way again. That's yeah. exactly right. Diane Collins mentions that it has been wonderful for her to watch Billy develop his poems. And I've had that same experience. Um, it's wonderful to behold the creative force. Mm -hmm. And I thought I knew what creativity was uh, before. I thought playing the piano was creativity or playing the violin, but, but that's a little different. Uh, our sons, one in particular, is p particularly creative uh, writing music, and they both are at this point. And I watched them. They'd come home, especially our one son, humming a tune. And I'd say, where did that come from? And he said, I, it just came into my head as I was walking home. And he immediately goes to the piano and then went up and wrote it down, recorded it. I don't have that inside myself. That's something I think people are born with. Mm -hmm, There's mm -hmm. something about it that's very unusual. And John will be at a restaurant. We'll be with our children or family eating and all at once. It'll He's come. writing on his <laughs> knee, and, and we're continuing our conversation. <laughs> Don't look at that man behind the curtain. No, I, I frequently embarrass the family. Yes. <laughs> He's always looking for a piece of paper somewhere. Uh, well, mm. being creative is exhausting, isn't it? It's actually joyous. It's uh, joyous. Yeah, it's not exhausting to oh, me. No. So then I must not In be fact, creative because that, no. I find it so exhausting, what I, I think is creative. It's exhausting watching somebody else be creative. Oh, I think, I, I feel like uh, when I'm really in a book writing, uh, like I'm, I'm burning calories just sitting there. Yeah. It's such, a, such an expenditure of energy. Right. And you so just really I, forget the time. I love it. There's, there's many ways to live intent, intensely, and we all do that in our own ways. Uh, but uh, what Penny calls the creative life uh, is, uh, has a certain uh, exhilaration that is its own thing. It's, mm -hmm. very, it's one of the things. Now, what are you going to do next? Living. I mean, you've, you've just finished the. Oh, I've got next book. You're yeah, freeing up your time a little bit, business-wise. Mm -hmm. What's coming next? I, well, I've got uh, uh, a couple of ideas for books after that that I, that I look forward to getting on, and I've started work on some of those. Um, and then I got a wonderful phone call a few months from Sarah Lawrence, who asked if they would, uh, if I would like to teach a course in the craft of poetry at their MFA program. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I was delighted and terrified. And MFA, Masters of... Master in Fine Arts. Right. And so my first class uh, is next uh, week. <laughs> That'll be my oh. first serious teaching ever, so I, I look forward to it. And I, what are you going to cover in this? Well, it's... it's is a it poetry writing how-to? No, it's it? actually studying the work of other poets. So it's not mm -hmm. a writing workshop, yeah. of which Sir Lawrence does and does very well. This is rather... Uh, me with a seminar of about 20 graduate students, and we're just going to read some of the great poetry of the world Sounds and talk about wonderful. it. I Sounds look forward great. to it. Uh, yeah. Now, you have together, uh, it's called the Penny and John Barr um, Poetry, um, help me out in the name. Collection. Collection. Now, where John is that? Penny Barr poetry tell, me, collection. tell us about that, Penny. I mean, what is that? Well, we, we were looking at the Bronxville Library here mm -hmm. and their poetry collection and although it is good it is small mm -hmm. and it could have it needs filling in and we thought it would be a wonderful thing to give the uh, to give a collection of poetry to the library over a period of years mm -hmm. so John and I have done research John I think I would say has done most of the research on how to start the collection 
and we have the first 35 books that are arriving now. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't and it's that nice wonderful? For us Most to be able of you to didn't give know that. that. And I'm, I'm, I can say firsthand, before the poetry club meetings, I used to run over here and try to find <laughs> the right <laughs> so poetry did a lot of book. Other people. Nothing. <laughs> no, not too much. Yeah. So I'm mm -hmm. so delighted. I know we all are uh, if, delighted to hear if, that you're doing that. If I could that. add just a thought to that, we thought this would be a nice way that we could help in the renovation of the library. So, so many families in this town were so generous in various there ways. There are so so many. And yeah. this and uh, this was just a small way. And our our hope would be to make this one of the best poetry collections of its kind in the libraries in this area. There are great academic collections mm -hmm. in the city, but this ought to be better than just a casual collection. And oh, ultimately, I, we hope that it would reach a few hundred volumes in size. Mm -hmm. And both of you had the background. You're president of the New York. Uh, the Poetry Society of America. Poetry Society of America. I'm emeritus now, but I did that for I mean, five years. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. you you have worked with that too. I mean, I have. they obviously have a big collection. They there. do. Yes, they do. They so. have a, a reference collection. And I can remember some time ago for the Bronxville School Foundation that you worked on a project there to tell us just with a, your help. Sure. We one of our projects was how to get poetry into the classroom, uh -huh. and so we had the thought that. Uh, Poetry in Motion, which are the placards of poems that you see in the subways and bus systems of New York and mm -hmm. now in almost 20 cities around the United States, it would be great to take those placards and make them available to public schools for teachers to put up on their blackboards. They're just they're one-shot right. poems, yeah. uh, almost sound bites, but a little more than that. So that was a fun thing to do. Getting that going. But, but speaking of poetry collection experience, Penny, you might Yes, I, I think the idea originally came um, after I joined the Poets House Board, uh, the Poets House That's is... That's right. Tell us about the Poets House and for, for people yes, who don't know. Yes, the Poets know. House is not as well known, perhaps, as the Academy of American Poets or the Poetry Society of America, but it is the third organization that is a real uh, long-standing organization in New York City. Uh, and it was founded by Stanley Kunitz, who is three poets ago, the Poet Laureate, of the mm -hmm. United States. There was an article in The Villager three years ago about him that I wrote. And he was 93 at the time he was Poet Laureate, Isn't which is something? wonderful. Yeah. He's great. such a great reader of poetry. And poetry can last a lifetime. It, it can, can. And he, yeah. with a woman, had the idea to start a poet's house. The poet's house is on Spring Street now, and we hope at some point in the future to have an actual house, which would be, I suppose, a large brownstone. Mm -hmm. They have 40,000, over 40,000 volumes of pure poetry. Isn't that something? And every year they add another 2,000, 2,500 volumes of poetry. They try to collect all the books that are published every year. So you can imagine that the and volumes the are growing by 3,000 right? books a year. And I'm on the board there. Uh -huh. I went on three years ago. Uh, they thought I could probably help because of my connection with yeah. poetry through John and they needed some people to really delve into what can Poets House do to be a better place and to improve its uh, its um, library and it's great we have a, a wonderful group of New York people I'm the only person from outside the city so I'm honored to have that mm -hmm. and I love to go into the city but it's it's a great place and there when I saw their library I thought gee there's so many books here all poetry and we don't have that many books in the Bronxville Public Library. We really maybe ought to try to get them here. Get them here and have a very special There's something collection. something especially about poetry where you need to hold the book. I mean, I know we can go on mm -hmm. lying now, and but and e are coming. maybe it's just me, but mm -hmm. I don't know. There's something about being able to read it again and again and and to take it, it with you in. wherever you right, go. Yeah. Well, um, we could go on for two hours with, with these two. Uh, unfortunately, we can't. Um, and I thought we would end, maybe some of you uh, remember John, uh, when he gave the centennial poem two years ago, the Bronxville centennial poem. And I thought we'd take this opportunity to end by him doing a very short reading of the very end of that poem, since it's about Bronxville and since John was our poet laureate for that yeah. centennial. That's a nice idea. Thank you. I, uh, I, when I was uh, asked by uh, the mayor, Nancy Hand, uh, to 
take this on, to write a poem for the Centennial of the Village, uh, I was delighted to be asked. I took a year to do it and uh, sort of set aside my other writing, and it was a great experience in itself. But this is the, uh, this is the ending of the poem, Marcia. Okay. Um, how curious, then, when nothing lasts, a town based on a view of human conduct, a village, as a set of values that survives from those firstings in the fields of 1898. Here in the depths of May, our high school seniors sit for the pageant that will take them out of themselves and into the broader fetches of the world. Whether to engage the high concerns of state and soul or the business of building family and character, or simply to make of their lives small islands of decency, they go in the grip of a great story slowly told. In the manner of large balloons may they, the wicker burden of our future, rise suspended by our loves. Oh, thank you, John. It's just wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. For well, thanks to the two of you very much for joining us. I again want to remind you of The Villager, and I want to take this opportunity to say that our own Peter North, who is the yes. cameraman and does so much <laughs> to put these living history uh, tapes together, <clears throat> has his poem in this in this booklet too he he went, he came in third he came in third on this but uh, it's a wonderful his poem, poem is lovely and uh, the other two from Bronxville uh, are certainly worth reading again thank you both very much thank for you. joining thank me thank you Marsha thank you very much for joining me too and good night <laughs>